All right, so let's get going here. Um, should the due date for that first homework was when? Today. So if you did it by, by hand, you can turn that in at the end of class. Um, or you still have a little bit more to do by the end of the day. Um, you can always upload, right? Uh, or the assignment is on Canvas, you should be able to kind of upload like a PDF or pictures, or if you can scan it, um, you know, some some version or however you want to, you know, or if you, know, you can upload those to Canvas as well, and I can grade them from there. Um, but yeah, at the end of class, if you do have them here today physically, you can kind of turn those in. Okay. Um, any other questions for me for jumping into things here? Yeah. I will not be in my office today, unfortunately. I have actually... I and I drive every single weekend on Friday afternoons, <laughs> so um, I'm never going to be probably uh, not every Friday, but most Fridays I won't be available. So I can try to shoot you like if you shoot me an email, I can try to get you a response. So, any other questions? Okay, so we'll go through this relatively quick at first. I got a lot of stuff I want to try to show you in Excel today that'll kind of help you with your project, but also kind of relate to some of the material that we've we've talked about. So. Um, but a little bit more like just to finish up the discussion about monopoly power. You know, one thing that's very interesting in sport, like you know, we think the government shuts down monopolies in most industries. Um, but we have several instances where they've actually, you know, the sporting leagues allow them to maintain monopoly power, right? So, um, you know, I think about maybe the, the argument is the government believes they're a natural monopoly. Right. And so that there should only be one, um, you know, professional league for whatever specific sport we're looking at. Um, you know, we can go back through baseball. Um, it's kind of the first one where we saw the courts actually decide, you know, to kind of make a judgment about whether or not they were acting with monopoly power or you know, kind of exhibiting monopoly behaviors. If you go back far enough, um, the American League and the National League. Um, were kind of competing with each other. They weren't all under the same umbrella. Um, in 1915, another league tried to join, was the Federal League. Um, by this point, the American National League had kind of come under one, right? So it's almost like a cartel, right? You had two different companies who then joined together to now have one company and act like a monopolist. Right? So what they did was they prevented their players from signing with this additional league. Um, kind of, you know, you know, putting barriers to entry. So they went to the, the, the courts, went, started in Illinois. Um, and this guy kind of saw Mountain Landis, which is a great, great name. Um, basically sided with the MLB and said, no, they can restrict these players from going to this competing league, which in any other industry, like we wouldn't see this, you know, the courts decide to do this. Uh, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but he also became the MLB's first commissioner, so maybe there's a little quid quid pro quo there. But this is kind of the first time that we saw really that baseball got an exemption from these things like the Sherman Act and and, and some of the other what's the other one? There's a, some other antitrust act. I forget the name of it off the top of my head. Um, we talked about monopsony power. So just to kind of finish that, we also have kind of see, you know. Other leagues try to pop up and compete occasionally. Um, you know, most of them have failed. <laughs> there, there aren't a whole lot there kind of, um, that have are able to compete. We can probably think of this probably is that there's a natural monopoly for a lot of these sports. That there is only enough demand to support one professional league. Although sometimes that's not the case. I mean, usually if the either these uh, competing leagues either fail. Or with the idea of like the American National League in baseball, the idea of the NBA and the ADA in basketball, you see that the competing league starts doing well enough, both leagues realize, you know, it'd be a whole lot better if we just joined and acted like a monopolist, right? So that's typically what we see. They don't drive the other firm out. They start to act like a cartel, right? And the NCAA kind of would work in a very similar way. So we're thinking about comparing these. Pretty basic model, right? And if we can think about, well, you can think about this as whatever 
product. We do the ticket market. We could do, we'll just do the ticket market to keep a little bit easier. So let's say we've got our ticket market, right? If I've got two kind of competing firms, they can think about, all right, look, we know that uh, if we act as a monopolist, right, kind of come together, we'll face the entire demand curve. We can set this higher price, right? Now, the problem is, and this, I guess we're assuming they have the same capacity stadiums. The problem is, if we have competing leagues, we aren't facing the entirety of the demand curve, right? The entirety of the demand curve is only if we are the only firm, or sorry, the, the only league that exists. You can kind of think about it as what you would see is, and I'm drawing it pretty dramatic, right? Even if they kept some monopolistic competitive power, as soon as you get kind of a competing league, it's going to drive the demand down, reducing potentially quantity, and we'll kind of call this new, uh, uh, I'll just call it you with a little cut take there. All right, so you can see that the price that they can charge for tickets is falling. They're selling fewer of them. They've kind of decreased their revenues, right? Or decreased profits. Um, so it's basically like, all right, why would we want to live in this world? Let's just come together. Then we'll be one league facing the entirety of demand, able to command a much higher price. Right? And like I said, this is just like an example of a ticket market. You can kind of think about modeling this across all revenue streams. It'd be a very similar idea, right? You just want to go from having some monopolistically competitive power to having just monopoly power. Right? So the NCAA can be thought of as a cartel as well, because it's just coordinating all of these different teams, all these different companies' um, actions to kind of promote, right, the, 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 promote the general interests of the NCAA. Right. So by coordinating the actions, creating barriers to entry, like you can't just any college join any you know specific conferences, but they kind of ensure that they're going to keep their monopoly power right, in terms of collegiate football. Okay. Um, but it's also kind of interesting that unlike other industries, we may want to think about and cartels like, has like a bad connotation, but it may not be a bad thing. Right. Because we already talked about kind of coordinating some of the similar interests, like regulating things like off-field behavior or PEP use, right, might actually be better for society, right? Or might produce a product that has more surplus in that market. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's not that we necessarily, you know, think we shouldn't always think cartels are always a bad thing. Uh, if we have negative or positive externalities that might exist from things like off-field behavior, potentially they can kind of help alleviate some of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's all I want to say here because what I want to kind of go to is making sure we do a little bit of game theory today, right? So I don't know, sure in 201, did you guys, everyone probably talked a little bit about game theory or you've seen it used in, in other, other courses. So I'll do a very basic model here today just to kind of remind us and we'll kind of use this moving forward throughout the semester. OK, so let's think about the NCAA, their cartel. They're trying to coordinate the actions of all their teams, right, and improve, kind of maximize profits for the entire league. Okay? So let's say the NCAA limited the number of games that they put on TV. Right? So why might they want to do this? Um, well, I mean, if there's more games on television, there's more substitutes, right? Each game has a little bit less value. Right, there's a, there's a higher supply, then you know, I've got more substitutes. If we were to think about, I'm not able to keep the value of those games as high, so I might want to restrict the number of games. Right? So they used to restrict the number of games, and then, unlike the, uh, Major League Baseball, Supreme Court actually ruled in favor of, or I said in favor of, kind of ruled in favor of the complainants. Right, so there were some schools who went to the courts and said, Look, the NCAA, like. I think it was Oklahoma, we'll see in a second when that's right. Um, all of our, you know, demand for our games is so high that we should have all of our games on TV. The NCAA isn't allowing us to put these two or three games on. They took it to the court and the court sided with Oklahoma or these teams who kind of had a complaint about this behavior, right? So um, a lot more deals were made in the following year, right? The Supreme Court said, yeah, the NCAA can't restrict you from kind of putting your, your, your games out there. So if you can sell you the right to your game through these different networks, by all means, now you can go for it, right? So a lot more games are on TV, 
But when there's more games on TV, the value of each game decreases, especially when you have all these, you know, higher number of substitutes now. Um, some of those teams, yeah, Oklahoma was one of them. Um, they experienced a 50% decrease in their TV revenue the following year. So, yeah, they got really greedy and they thought, yeah, well, you know, eight of our games are on, you know, on TV, but we want all of them to be on. Well, if you were the only game on TV at the time, right? Yeah, you could get a whole bunch of revenue, but as soon as there's 50 other games on that same temp same time slot, uh, now that revenue dramatically falls, right? So the per game revenue fell a lot by having these additional substitutes. So even if I can put four or five more of my games on TV, the value of each game was dramatically reduced, leading to kind of 50% decrease in overall revenue there. Um, so what did these teams get wrong, right? They shouldn't have went to, you know, they should have trusted the NCAA that they weren't idiots. Um, and we can kind of use game theory to kind of understand this situation. Okay. So, to, uh, you know, all we're going to do game theory wise is set up a pretty basic uh, payoff matrix, right? So we're generally going to keep this as, and I'll do some examples later on this semester where we have more than two, but we're going to do two strategies and two players, right? So the Nash equilibrium of these games is going to be the little definition is we are both best responding to each other's best response, right? So if you haven't seen A Beautiful Mind, I always mention it because it's a great movie. I haven't watched it in a while, but it's a great movie about a real economist. Very interesting. We'll spoil it. So go through this pretty quick, kind of refresh our memory, and then we can kind of jump into some actual problems here. So we've got two players, right? We can have more players, but generally the models we'll look at will kind of simplify this down to two different players. We'll mainly look at when we have simultaneous decisions. In, in the sporting examples that we'll work through, we don't have as many that are sequential. So like I make a decision, then you make a decision. There is some of that, right? A lot of times we'll think about examples where we're making simultaneous decisions. We then have, okay, what are those decisions or what are those strategies, right? We'll define what those are. And then the combination of the different strategies that the players can choose, right, will result in different payoffs, right? So we're going to use a matrix to kind of you know, show what these payoffs are, that looks something like, I'm going to skip ahead here, something like this. This is a very general model. Right? I've got firm two and firm one. They can choose to either set a high or a low price. And as a result of them, we'll set a high price. Here's player one's payoffs, sorry, player firm one and firm two's payoffs, right? So I can kind of use these, these um, I don't know, cut this into, into triangles, going to represent that. A lot of the times when I'm writing this out, I'll generally like from one's payoff, comma, and then I'll put from two's payoff, right? So you can kind of show it either way, like from one, from two, or player one, player two's payoffs, or a lot of times we'll see them kind of written out in this kind of more matrix form when you get these, these triangles. Right? I think it's a little bit easier to do this, so I, I generally try to do that. So I'll skip ahead a little bit. Oh, so I don't have an example in the slides. Um, well, when I work through the example that we'll eventually get to, I'll write it out this way. And that's typically how I'll kind of put it on the exam or on homeworks, right? I won't use the, this kind of diagonal, but if you've seen that before, and that's like the format you're used to, um, you know, you can still write it out this way for yourself. I don't care, but I'm generally going to write the payoffs just for this comma separating it. Okay. So, um, what we're going to be looking for, right, is what the equilibrium of these games are, right? If a player has a dominant strategy, that is going to mean that their best response or their, their strategy that's going to op, uh, maximize their payoff is the same regardless of what the other person does, right? So you can think of a lot of situations where this wouldn't be the case, you know, think about even if I'm competing, you know, deciding to put my, my game on TV, and uh, if I choose to put it on Monday, well, the other team is putting it on a Monday, uh, then I'm not, that's not optimal, right? But if the other team decides instead to put their game on Tuesday, right, chooses a different strategy, well, now it might be optimal for me to keep my game on that Monday, right? So what the other person does there, it changed my decision. The idea of the dominant strategy is I don't care what the other team does. I'm, I, the, I know that even if they put a game on the same day as me, I can maximize profits by putting it on that Monday, right? So if they choose to put their game on Monday or Tuesday, it doesn't matter. I'm still going to choose to put my game on Monday. So that would be the idea of a dominant strategy. A prisoner dilemma exists when we end up in this Nash equilibrium where both 
parties, both players actually have a lower payoff than if they could come to an agreement to choose other strategies. Right? So we'll see an example of this here in just a second. So this kind of gets at the idea of what happened with the NCAA and the loss in, in television revenue, right? So I'm setting it up and simplifying a little bit. We've got two teams, right? So we'll think about this as we've got what IU and Purdue, right? They're kind of sharing. You kind of think about a similar market. Um, so those are going to be our two two teams. So we've got Purdue <clears throat> here, IU uh, here. Right? They're going to make decisions independent about how many of their games they want to televise. Right? This is the kind of the, the general setup. So they can either put um, they can either put out half of their games, right, or televise all games. We're going to simplify it down there. Now, in reality, right, you could choose, you know, not just all or half. You could do however many games they play, so like 30, 29. Well, you would just have a whole bunch of more strategies. We're going to simplify it down to just two, right, putting all of their games out there or putting half their games out there. So you can think about this as all games, all games, or only putting out half of the games, right? Or televising half the games. So here's our matrix, right? We've got our players, our strategies. Now we need to figure out what our payoffs are. So if both teams televise all their games, they're both going to earn eight million the following season. So Eight million will be the payoff for both teams in that situation, right? We then assume, okay, if both teams televise half their games, right, so that they can kind of like alternate which, you know, which games are on which days, well, then they can actually both make 14 million, okay? So obviously, if they could come to an agreement ahead of time, like this is a lot more attractive than this, right? But why, we'll eventually see, oh, sorry, this ends up being the Nash equilibrium, which has a lower payoffs, making this a kind of prisoner's dilemma example. So if the setup was, okay, if one team puts on half their games, but the other team decides to put on all of them, well, yeah, for the games that kind of overlap, there will be a loss to that team that put all their games on, but they also have twice as many games, and the other team doesn't have games to compete with the other half, right? And so... Whichever team decides to put all their games on, if the other one only puts half of their games, we get this payoff of what? 18 million and 4 million, right? And kind of think about it as the team that only put half their games on, all those games they're competing with the other, the other, uh, the other school or the other team, right? Whereas for Purdue, yeah, you know, I put all my games on, half of them I'm only going to be earning 14, but for all those other games where I don't have any competing, you know, televised games from my other team, I can make a, a, a lot more money. Right? And then kind of the flip side, if I you put all their games on, right, but Purdue only put half their games on, then Purdue only gets four million, <laughs> IU gets eighteen million. Okay. So a lot, I think, maybe in your two hundred one courses wasn't too much building these matrices. A lot of the times it, they're kind of given to you. So the problems that I'll maybe expect you to do is to take the information like this and then kind of create your own payoff matrix and then solve for what that Nash equilibrium is, right? So like I said, we'll, we'll get different types of examples. Some will start dealing with like revenues and profits. Here, I'm kind of just keeping it thinking about like, this is the amount of money they've generated. We haven't factored in costs or anything. Um, hopefully you can kind of see like from this information, I can figure out what the players' the strategies are and I can figure out what those, those payoffs are going to be. Any questions on, on anything that I set up there? Does it matter which firm is like firm one? Or it doesn't two? matter which way you you label it. Mm -hmm. I could even flip the strategies. Mm -hmm. As long as you make sure the payoffs, if I make IU player one here, then I need to make sure that I'm writing their payoff first. Yeah, so as long as I, I make sure I'm writing my payoffs, player one, player two, it doesn't matter how I, I kind of set this up. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you go back to the definition of the prisoner dilemma? Yeah. So prisoner's dilemma is going to be the idea that we end up in a Nash equilibrium where both parties could be better off if they 
could agree to make different uh, strategy choices. So I'll show you here how we solve these, and then we'll talk about why this is a prison salon. So I go through, I say, okay, look, if Purdue puts all of their games aside, I'm putting all, televising all my games, what is it optimal for IU to do? Well, if they put all their games on TV as well, they'll get 8 million. If they put half their games on, they're only gonna get four, right? Well, 8 million is a lot better than 4 million. And so they would choose to also televise all their games. If Purdue decides to put on half their games, what is it optimal for IU to do? Well, if they choose to put on all of their games, they get 18 million. If they put on half their games, they're only going to get 14. 18 is better than 14, right? And then on the flip side, what if IU puts all their games on? What should Purdue do? Well, their payoff if they put all their games on is eight versus half of the games would only give them 4 million. And then what if IU puts on half their games, but Purdue puts on all their games, they get 18 million versus if they only put half, they get 14. So they would kind of choose to, to put on all their games into that situation. Now, the reason I'm circling what these best responses are to each of the other strategies that the other person can do, right? So when I was going through Purdue's decisions, I was saying, okay, assume IU chooses all games. What is Purdue's best response? Put on all their games. Assume that IU is only putting in half their games. What's Purdue's best response to that decision, right? Now, once I figured out both players' best response to all of the other possible strategies from the other player, here I'm keeping it easy, just two, each person has two. Whenever I see that I am best responding to what the other person is doing and they're best responding to what I'm doing, that's how we identify these Nash equilibrium, right? Because if I end up here, right? If I'm Purdue, why would I ever choose to put on half my games? I would just be sacrificing money, right? And even if we were in the scenario where, let's say we came to an agreement and we both said, let's, we're only gonna televise half our games, we'll alternate days, you know, basically be the only game on, right? And so we can generate a lot more revenue. All right, cool, we agree to that, right? But what happens? Well, I am Purdue, I'm like, well, I'll tell them that I'll do that. But if I then decide to put on all of my games, I know that I use gonna lose out on a bunch and I'm gonna gain, right? So there's always this incentive to be the one that puts all my games on television first, right? So this kind of pulls each team, right? And it gives them these dominant strategies, right? Notice Purdue always decides to put on all their games regardless of what IU does. That's a dominant strategy. IU is always choosing to put on all of their games regardless of what Purdue does. They have a dominant strategy as well. So we've got these two dominant strategies. It doesn't matter what the other person does. It's always optimal to be the you know, to put on all of your televised, all of your games. Problem is that results in a Nash equilibrium where both teams have lower payoffs than if they could agree to stick to, or if they could stick to an agreement where they both only televise half their games. Right? So this was kind of like the scenario that NCAA was in before the lawsuit. Then after the law, you know, the teams were looking at it and said, yeah, but it's always better for me to be the ones putting all, they didn't kind of anticipate that once there are all of these games, we kind of move to this new scenario where each game is like less valuable, right? And then we can never get back unless we have like a governing body. We can never by individual decision making to get back to that scenario where we had half team or teams choosing to only put on half of their games. Any questions on this idea or on kind of the, the setup of these this payoff matrix of game theory? Hopefully it's like a little bit of a review, just kind of like a, a sports Did specific. You say that we wouldn't be doing strategies at all yeah i won't push it as far as mixed strategy uh, i might i won't expect it of you i might bring in a, an example of it um once we get to some player kind of performance player statistic stuff because you can do interesting things like if a goalie you know, like a penalty kick you i think if i remember right i believe if you look at the percentage like a mixed strategy actually makes more sense in that scenario but yeah i'll be keeping it just kind of simple here any other questions? All right. So I left that kind of open. We could do a similar thing. Um, I was thinking about like, was Pete Carroll wrong when he was ran for or not? I think I'm going to hold off on this because um, I want to just kind of get to game theory, but I really wanted to focus a little bit more on Excel and show you some things with some data today. Um, but you could do a similar thing where you say, okay, look, I've got two teams. And there's one play, right? Last play of the game. What should I do, right? 
Now I'm simplifying it. There's obviously several plays you can choose from, but you can think about it as like every single strategy, every play that I could choose, if the defense chooses a certain strategy, that would result in different probabilities. So you can actually you really wanted to go through like the play by play data, right? Kind of figure out what type of defense was ran and what type of offensive play was ran to figure out, okay, what's the percentage if we run this type of play against this defense, you know, if they decide to choose a defensive scheme that's better against the run and we run the ball, well, then we know the probability that we score touchdown isn't that, that high. But if we choose to run the ball and they choose a defensive strategy that's anticipating a pass, well, then the probability would be higher for us, right? So you can kind of go through that thought experiment. I, I'm just choosing numbers here. I tried to, to look at kind of what the success was of the average team in, the, in these time periods. Um, but you could, you know, these would always be different no matter what teams you had. You could set up a payoff matrix and do a very similar thing. I'll probably revisit this next week because there's something I want to skip ahead to. Here we go. Within season variation. All right. So I want to show you this, and then I want to go to kind of looking at next stuff. So we're going to start to talk about competitive balance a little bit more in depth. We, we kind of discussed it with revenue sharing, the idea of trying to bring these teams kind of closer to the same targeted wins. So if we look at win percentage across the league, we might want to know how much variation is there in that. So we go back to kind of statistics, 221, we can calculate a standard deviation. Right. Well, we know just by the, the way that the, uh, I guess, I guess if we assume away ties for a second, I'll explain how we could factor in ties. But let's assume that we have a league where ties don't occur. Okay. Um, like basketball, that'd be it. What by design does the average win percentage have to be? Every single game, one person wins, one person loses, right? So I know my mean will always be 0.5 for win percentage. I then just look at every single team's win percentage, deviation from that point, square that, add them all up, divide by however many teams I've got, right? This would give me kind of the standard deviation and win percentage across all my teams. And I'll show you how in Excel, we're not do this by hand, we've got the built-in function, we can do this pretty quickly. But you'll notice, kind of the, we think about the number of, of teams here, um, different leagues would have different or kind of varied uh, if I have a higher number of teams that's going to increase my denominator decreasing the overall fraction right so just by simply having more teams in a league you're kind of driving down that standard deviation win percentage so um, another way of thinking about this is because we're calculating win percentage across and number of games, right? This N in the bottom can actually think about as representing the number of games. Right? So if a number of games in a sport increases, then we're just generally going to see their standard deviation be lower, right? or their variance be lower. So notice if I compare across these leagues, you know, the, the league that has the smallest number of games has the highest standard deviation win percentage. The team that has the highest number of games has the lowest standard deviation win percentage, right? And that's a, just a byproduct of the fact that how we calculate these win percentages is using that total number of games, right? And you can kind of think about this as um, even if every team was, was equally as likely, we're just going to see that over a longer sample. So like one game in the NFL changes that win percentage a lot more than one win in Major League Baseball, right? It's one out of 162 as opposed to one out of 17 now, I guess, right? So if we're just looking at actual data, right, that deviation is always going to be a lot more. Right? So we'll factor that in, right, and think about, okay, we know that the leagues that have a higher number of games are going to end up having a lower variance or a lower standard deviation value. So what we're going to do, so I kind of already talked through this, is the optimal standard deviation for different leagues will depend on the number of games they play. So if we think about the ideal or the optimal standard deviation, we can actually work out that it should be 0.5 divided by whatever the square root of the number of games is, right? So for Major League Baseball, this is gonna be a relatively low number, right? The ideal standard deviation should be pretty low because it's 162 on our denominator here. For the NFL, that would be a lot higher, right? Because it would only be divided by the square root of 17, right? So 
what we'll then do is take the actual standard deviation we calculate from the wind percentages, and then we'll divide that by what the ideal standard deviation is, right? So you can kind of think about like, let's say I saw uh, the standard deviation be 0.5, right? But the ideal was 0.75, right? As opposed to maybe I saw in a different league, they had the same standard deviation, but their ideal was 0.5. So if I can get my standard deviation to be exactly the same as the ideal, this ratio would be one. Any further away I get from what that ideal standard deviation is, I get less, you know, lower and lower below one. Right? So a higher ratio here represents kind of how close I am to my ideal standard deviation. Right? So now once I account for this ideal standard deviation based off of the number of games, I now get this ratio where I can compare across leagues. So I had some examples here from two different time periods. Um, I got some data I'll show you here in a second Excel. But we had you know, calculated standard deviation. You can also calculate what that ideal standard deviation is. Notice for the NBA and NHL it should be exactly the same. They play the same number of games. Right? And then take that ratio. Right? So um, Actually, here, I think the example I did here doesn't make sense because I would have to have an ideal standard deviation uh, that's less than whatever I see. Right? So something like that, 0.4. So all I'm doing is taking the standard deviation divided by the ideal to get the ratio. And now I can start to make statements about which league has the best competitive balance. Right. So I'm looking here. Once I account for the fact that the ideal standard deviation will be different across these leagues, I come up with a much different story. Now it looks like the NBA right, is the, the furthest from their ideal standard deviation, right? They have the highest ratio, excuse me, um, and the lowest one ends up looking like now it's the NHL, whereas before we didn't account for the fact that there was a different number of games, it looked like the NFL was way more unbalanced, right? But that was just driven by the fact that one game kind of dramatically swings that win percentage in the NFL as opposed to one kind of win in these other leagues, right? So we've now got this ratio where we can kind of say, okay, if I can get closer to one, that represents more what we'll start calling parity, right? Or there's more competitive balance in the league, right? And we've already discussed a little bit about, you know, reducing outcome uncertainty. Um, or sorry, and we, we want to reduce certainty. We want to increase the uncertainty of the outcome, right? So people that uh, can drive that demand curve up. So how can we do some of this? I think at 2018, you can kind of see things change a little bit, but I think the ordering is the same. So I put up this NFL kind of win data uh, before class on Canvas on the in-class data folder. So, you know, just to get a little bit of, of, I don't know, experience in Excel, I'm gonna sit down for a second. Makes it a little bit easier to work. One thing that I generally always try to do, and you should do once I get, start getting people's project data out to them, is select the entire data set and just automatically throw a filter on it, all right? Um, just a good tool. It just makes it easier to look at the data. So the way I'll do that, right, once I have Excel open, is I'll go to that very first kind of variable name, hold control shift or command shift on a Mac. I can then use my arrow keys to go over and down to select the entire data set. And then going to go up to my data tab and go to filter, right? So I try to send these out with filters on them. If I forget, right, this is how you would do it. Right? So now I can say sort the data to see who had the highest number of wins, whatever, I can't remember what season this was, um, but I can sort it on all these different variables, right? Now, if I wanted to find my standard deviation, right, and let me zoom in a little bit here. Let's say I wanted to find the standard deviation and win percentage, right? We've got this built-in function, which is STEV. We're going to kind of treat this as, I mean, you could go either way. I, I would say sample data because we don't have every single game from every season here. If you really wanted to find your population as just 2000, uh, whatever this must have been, like 2021 or 2022, then yeah, this would be your population. But generally think about treating this as sample because it's not like we're going to have every single game that was ever played. Unless, I don't know, maybe there's some data sets out there that would have that. But but for most of our examples, we'll have a, a sample. 
I'm then going to go over. I could go to my win percentage here. Hold control shift. Hit the down arrow. Right Now, instead of scrolling back up, if I just hit enter, it closes that parenthesis for me and calculates the standard deviation. Okay. Is this looking familiar to, to, to a lot of you? Hopefully, if you took my class, this is very familiar, but um, I don't know how much the Excel gets used in every single every single section. So, you know, I then was like interested, okay, well, what would that ideal standard deviation be? We said that was going to be what? 0.5 divided by the square root of the number of games. I think this was still a 16-game season. So instead of 17, we would have a 16 games in there. We can kind of see we're a little bit above that ideal. We could then create our ratio, which is the actual standard deviation divided by my ideal standard deviation. Right. So that's how I was coming up with those values. Just going out and looking at the actual data, you can download these, you know, there's a bunch of different data sources out there where you can kind of look at what the win-loss record of teams was. If it didn't download the win percentage, so let's say I selected this and deleted it, how could I create my win percentage? Just... So what would I do? Yeah, I would take, actually it looks like this was a 17 game season. So I have to change that. Um, take the number of wins and divide it by however many total games there were. Well, even if I wasn't sure about the sport, right? If I add my wins, losses and ties together, I can actually reproduce that entire column. So another shortcut, if I do this for one observation, if I go down here to the bottom right and I double left click, once I get this black plus sign, <laughs> it'll copy this down to the very end of my data set. So this is really helpful. Like once you get some data, you might want to create different indicator variables or something like that. So I'll show you an example of that after I move this over and also change this to 17 since I must have had newer data than I thought. Um, so let's say I wanted to create an indicator for whether or not they won more than 50% of their games, right? So I've got my variable here that tells me that, but I want to create just a one zero variable, right? So one thing that you can do to, or you can use in Excel to start to create other variables in your data set that you might be interested in is use an if function, okay? So this might you know be applicable to some of your projects as you kind of get get into them. So there you will have to put what we want to test to see if it's true, which is is the value for this team's win percentage. I said greater than fifty percent, but I've got it as a decimal. So is it greater than oops 0.5? Right. Comma. If that's true, I want to put something in the cell which is a one. Comma. If it's not true, then this is just a zero. Okay. So we can use these if functions to create some indicator or dummy variables. Once again, if I double left click, I can kind of see it does this. And I had it sorted. That's why it's all ones and then all zeros, because I had it sorted based off of the win percentage anyways. Um, but that's one way you can kind of create new variables. Now, if you do, make sure that you reselect the data and put a filter on it, because now notice if I filter this data, <clears throat> It didn't move these. It, did, it didn't move the the data with it. It actually just kind of recalculated. So, Control Z to go back. What I would want to make sure I do is reselect the entire data set. Go to the Data tab. Make sure I put a filter back on it. Now, when I go up to the top, I'll notice. Oh yeah, now I've got a filter option on this variable I created as well. Okay. Yeah. Questions on that? All right. Um, I want to do a little bit more, but we should get to this paper based off of the time. So hopefully it's not too bad. Kind of see, we'll talk about this paper, but I'll first kind of ask you some questions. So if you had to respond, well, which of the following is not a finding of the paper? So player performance in the NBA increases in the year after a long contract is signed. Player performance in the NBA is not impacted by whether a player in the year prior to their signed contract 
player performance in the NBA increases in the year prior to a contract, player performance is impacted differently depending on the length of the contract. So which of the following would not be a fawning of the table? If you skimmed even through it, I think one of these should kind of stand out as, as being something that would not be a fawning of the table. All right. If you haven't gotten an answer in, take your best guess here. Oops. There's 18. 21 of us in here today. 22. Everybody's here today. All right. I'll ask you a second question. So this might be something that I do kind of moving forward as well. I think the last one is probably a little bit more difficult. But I want you to start paying attention to what data they're using on these papers. So, for instance, I could ask you what was the dependent variable we used in the paper list. And now that we kind of moved on, which of the following on the previous one was not oops, a finding of the paper? So the paper was about what? Yeah, it's like more examples. Maybe I'll just scan through it, read it. You already closed this one. Yeah. Yep. I'm leaving the other. I was trying to make a point before I go to the other one so I can make it a little bit easier. Yeah. Is it performance depending on like right before they assigned a multi year contract compared to performance within the contract? Yeah. So the general idea was if I'm in a year where my contract's over, right, I have to sign a new deal the following year. I'm going to be a little bit more incentivized, right, to, to perform well. And if I'm in the first year of a signed contract, I now feel like a little bit more protected. I might, you know, focus a little bit less on, on, on my score and then there's a little bit less in time. So the theory would be that we potentially see increased player performance in the year that their contract's ending and then decreased performance in that year after they sign a contract, right? What the paper found was that in fact is true, right? And so that would indicate that player performance does depend on whether or not you're in, you know, a year where you're going to sign a contract. So to say that they're not impacted, right, wouldn't make any sense. So that was the main finding of the paper was that in the year follow or sorry the year their contract was ending performance went up they called it called it like a contract year and then the year after a contract was signed we still saw player performance go down right? and then I added another one in there which if you kind of read through or looked at a glance at the tables they also kind of show how this is different depending on the length of the contract right it kind of makes sense if I sign a one year deal. I probably don't slack off as much as if I sign a five or 10 year deal in that first year. Yeah. So how did we kind of get that result? Well, if I'm thinking about player performance, right? Which of these might, might we want to think about as a dependent variable? Right? So attendance wouldn't really make any sense, right? Um, age wouldn't really make any sense. Shooting percentage. Well, that's a statistic. That's a player performance. So that one would make a little more sense. Or we can kind of look at, or if we had salary, right? That might be, we could use that as a proxy to be reflective of what the player's performance was, right? So I would probably say there, you know, I, in general, we're kind of thinking about this as we're looking at player performance statistics. So we would probably think about shooting percentage, right? So we go, whoops. So if we go to the paper, Right. And I'm I'm just gonna skim all the way down because this one's really nice. I believe they had an equation here. Here we go. So they they give us their regression equation. So they're using the following regression where Z is gonna be different contract pieces like total pay, length of the contract, um, average annual pay. So one of the dependent variables they used in here was actually was salary, right? So this wasn't their exact question, but this was part of how they had to get to the result, right? So they were looking at how different things, like different, um, you know, the age, um, the historical performance of the player, how all those things impacted the salary that they actually got, right? So that was their first regression. We'll look at those results right here. Right? So we can kind of see like, Previous performance resulted in here. They one will focus on just this composite matrix. We could break this down to like several different NBA metrics. We can kind of see here if my composite rating, and this is a higher performing player, goes up by one. Over there, measuring this is like kind of 
they were assigning a certain score to each player. So if it went up by one, right, one point, the contract value went up by point one six nine dollars. So I guess this deposit rating was was had a pretty large value um, since you know one point increase to impact the contract value by a whole lot. We would then think about it also increased contract length and then also the average annual salary, right? So here we found that it was statistically significant, right? Which makes sense. Player performance is going to predict higher player salaries. Okay. From there, we'll keep scrolling down. Now they've got their second regression, right? Where we're looking at P, which should be different performance metrics, shooting percentage, just composite rating, we look at rebounds, all these different things. They're going to use all the same controls. They've got like age and some other things that they describe. But the real kind of key here is, well, I now just include indicators that are one zeros. So what I just showed you, you do in Excel, right? Where it's a one, if it was in the year after signing a contract, zero if not. And then one, if it was in the year prior to or right before a new contract had to be signed, zero if not. So those coefficients should tell me that if this variable is a one, right? I'm in the year right before my contract ends. This would tell me the expected change in that player's performance, whether I'm using the composite rating or their shooting percentage or whatever. Here, this would tell me if this was a one, I'm in a year right after I signed a big contract. Here's the change I would see in player performance. Right? So on this pre variable, that coefficient beta pre, we probably expect it to be positive or negative. There's an increased incentive. Yeah, so I'm kind of positive, right? There's an increased incentive in that year right before I have to sign a contract. And if we think that there's any type of like, Ugh, I'm relieved and I got this here for another five years, that post variable might expect that it's negative, right? So we'll scroll down to their next table, right? And they broke this down to several different things, right? So on the question I asked, it's actually still open. I'll go back to it for everyone who's, who's at least paying attention to it, right? Right. But in one of their regressions, they were using salary, right? Just kind of estimate, get an idea about, okay, is salary related to performance? And then they use all these other different metrics, which one of them was shooting percentage. They also use a thing like composite rating. So we'll focus on the composite rating. You know, we could look at everything else, but this kind of tells the whole story, which you can see, okay, look, as a player gets older, their performance goes down. That, that's, you know, for every additional year of age, the performance is decreased. In that year following a signed contract, we see that this composite rating went down by 0.3. Now, what that means, hard to kind of translate the composite rating. So you might want to think about something like points for total rebounds went actually up by 0.165, right? And then in the year prior to a contract being signed, or like the last year of a contract, we actually saw performance goes up by about 0.38, right? So kind of what our theory predicted was actually supported by the data and that we see a player performing better in that year, you know, the contract is ending and then kind of performance going down the year following a sign contract. And I said, you could break this down for like kind of like a different type of metrics. You can kind of see here, you know, everything really increased in the year prior, points scored, total rebounds, assists, and so here, every single column is representing the results of a different regression, right? So every single regression, it was just a different a dependent variable, right? My dependent variable being that Y or that left-hand side variable. And everything's pretty, you know, statistically significant, right? I see a lot of stars here, right? And then I'm going to scroll down, make one more point here. So I thought there was another table I thought was interesting. So one thing that we'll start looking at, um, and I'll, I'll go a little bit more over this next week as well, but you might think that certain effects matter more for certain types of players, right? So maybe when I sign a big contract, right, the length of that contract matters, right? If it's only a one-year deal, then that's, you know, my performance might not get down very much. So we're going to include interaction terms, right? So an interaction term is just when you take two of your variables and multiply by each other. Okay? So now when we have this variable, which is in and out of the year after signing a contract times the length of that contract, what I can think of this is that, or 
think of this is here's the effect of being in a year after signing a contract. Here's the additional effect if that contract is one year long, right? Or two years, and I can translate that to two years long, right? So here, if I'm in a year following my contract, my performance might go down by 0.35. But if that's a longer contract, right, I would also have to add into my prediction this 0.142 for every additional year that contract was, right? So this is kind of like the idea of if you give me a really long contract, my performance doesn't dip as much. Maybe I, I, you know, I feel like I've you know, really got to reciprocate the kindness that you showed me as a player. Or so um, all right. Well, I ran out of time here. Um, so make sure you get a response to this last one. Think, uh, right, B or C, right, we had, we had there. Um, we'll pick up on this idea of competitive balance next week. If you have any last minute questions on the homework, I'll try to get an email back out to you this afternoon. Uh, other than that, also make sure you're uploading your pro project proposal by the end of the day as well. Um, and I'll start getting some of that data out there. All right. Have a fun, safe weekend. I'll see you guys on Monday.